Welcome back to Fake Science, the podcast devoted to finding and correcting science that's been distorted in the news. So far we've looked at common science misconceptions and fake climate science, and today we're going to look at how dangerous it can be to be healthy. Well, not really, because being healthy is by nature healthy, not dangerous. But what can get dangerous is health fads, supported by fake health science. Now, fake health science is a very broad topic with ongoing debates ranging from the dangers of chiropractors to the idea that your urine is an all-in-one beauty product. Our urine is loaded with minerals, vitamins, and raw enzymes. Why flush that away? Today, I'm going to keep it simple and have a brief look into how health fads are, as a general rule, unreliable, and also a bit of a look at why pseudoscience is so prolific in health products. You're listening to Fake Science. I wanted to kick things off by talking a bit about detoxes and that marketing gemstone of a buzzword, toxins, and what toxins actually are. But after Google left me dazed, confused, and quite frankly concerned for the human race, I decided to get an expert opinion. So I gave Professor Mike Berridge from the Maligan Institute a phone call. Hi there, Mike. Thanks for making some time to talk to me. So as a scientist, could you tell me what toxins actually are? Well, I mean... (laughs) Toxins are things that um, essentially interfere with living organisms. I mean, they've been defined in various ways, but virtually anything can be a toxin. It's the context in which it's put that's important. And uh, certainly most foods contain some toxins if you take them out of the context and concentrate them up. So, yeah, it, it, it's a big area. It's probably not that clearly defined unless you have a particular purpose or application that you're thinking of. But yeah, the term has been picked up by the sort of health and fad industry and and thrown around and it's probably more misused than it is used appropriately now. Right. Well, there's a website about a cleanse diet and on the website they say things like toxins from things like household products, food additives and cigarette smoke are stored in our fat cells until we detoxify. So claims yeah. like that, they're... Oh, that's certainly not true. Certainly things can accumulate, some chemicals can accumulate in the body, but many things are turned over quite quickly. Many of them are excreted. Some of them are not even absorbed into the body so if toxins are being misused as, as a terminology, as a phrase, then you get things like detox diets. Yes. Considering there's no evidence that detox diets work, how is it that our bodies manage whatever it is that people are considering to be toxins? Yeah, well, I mean, our bodies are, are magnificent machines for detoxification. I mean, we've sort of evolved and life has evolved over such a long period of time uh, to live in the environment with all sorts of highly toxic metal ions and compounds. You know, the liver is a massive uh, organ in your chest and, and it's the primary detoxification organ uh, in the body. But many different tissues can detoxify and, of course, the kidneys select out and, and excrete lots of compounds that would end up being toxic if they accumulated in the body. So, yeah, detox, irrigation, cleanses, body cleanses, all of those things, there's very little, if no evidence. In fact, mostly they can do more harm than, than good, I think. Is, is there any kind of merit to the idea that like fluid or like juice cleansers do anything particularly beneficial? No, I think the problem is with juices is that they are often made from concentrated fruits, which are quite abnormal, natural fruits are fine, they have the sugars in them, but if you put 10 apples or 10 oranges into a glass and drink that, you've suddenly elevated your sugar intake in order of magnitude, and so, you know, it's the same as taking a glass of water, almost, and putting 30 teaspoons of sugar in it. Oh, wow. (laughs) So definitely not helpful. Uh, No. So they also don't have any of these properties that people try to convince themselves that they've got that, you know, by having juice, it'll clean your body. Yeah, there's very little evidence that that is true. Mm. Um, I, I, I mean, there's certainly vitamins and, and minerals and, and carbohydrates and juices that, that are valuable, but the problem is that you're taking a particular fluid or uh, set of, of food substances and you, you're taking them away out of context. Well, so, so you mentioned that uh, some of these can actually just be harmful. Yeah. What are the kind of dangers of them? The harm would be that you are completely or largely destroying the the number of cells is is phenomenal. The bacteria, and those bacteria, many of them are beneficial. So you all of a sudden decide you want to cleanse your gut or or 
will flush your system out and it's a bit like taking high dose uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. You're getting rid of enormous numbers of healthy microbes. You live in a balance with what's called your microbiome and cleansing the outside surfaces or, or the inside linings of your body can be really harmful and is certainly not best health practice from a science point of view nor from a medical point of view and it's a good idea I think to ensure that you get a good range of foods. In fact the whole best dietary advice now is food variety not fad foods and I think you'll find that most food detoxifications are quite selective and quite narrow in the types of food that they uh, they advise. Um, so I think best advice is really that rather than fat foods is, is a balanced and healthy diet. Excellent, yeah. Yeah. This is Fake Science with Bronte Wilson. So the takeaway from Mike is that toxins aren't really an established thing, our bodies are self-cleaning, and some of these fads can be dangerous. Yet still, there are endless products saying they're there to help you detoxify or offering other health benefits. But if these diets and products aren't backed by science, why does it seem like they are? I decided to talk to Mark Hanna, consumer advocate, science communicator, and chair of the Society for Science-Based Healthcare. And Mark regularly debunks pseudoscience in his blog, Honest Universe. So, Mark... Health and nutrition sure seem to have quite a lot of pseudoscience going on. You're right, there is a lot of pseudoscience in the health area. And I'm sure you've heard of the good old buzzword toxins? It's broadened in these dietary terms to mean a whole bunch of things, including very, very, very vague things. That's kind of what gets counted on a lot of the time. So the lack of there being a structured definition of what toxins are allows people to say, oh, it's what's in your toxins, without ever getting specific or needing actual science? Yeah, the way it gets used in this sphere is basically a catch-all for bad things, but I won't tell you what the bad things are because then you might check if it actually does anything with them. Kind of like plausible deniability. Oh no, I didn't say it helped with this specifically, just toxins. But it's not just toxins and detoxes, is it? You get it in a lot of other bits of health as well. It's, it's similar to how uh, you'll see advertising that talks about winter ills and chills. I'm going to be getting a lot of this coming out real soon. They don't want to say colds and flu because then you could say, hey, actually, this doesn't help with that. But winter ills and chills, they can kind of slip by a little bit because it's non-specific. It's hard to nail down. So is there any kind of like a regulation or anything? Or how is it that people are able to say things like, oh, this tea supports healthy liver function if there isn't any proof? I I is there any regulation? So that, that wording you use is real interesting. Supports healthy liver liver function. The way our regulation works, we've kind of got two layers. Um, the first layer is we've got industry self-regulation, so the advertising industry regulates itself. That's the Advertising Standards Authority. And they have a set of rules that allows claims like supports healthy liver function without any evidence for them. And that's very specific sort of wording. Well, what it's basically saying, if you read it, you know, very literally, not how it's like to be interpreted by everyone, but if you read it literally, it's if you have a healthy liver, this won't mess that up. That's how it seems to be interpreted by the regulation. Of course, people buying the stuff will not be interpreting it that way. They'll be thinking, oh, it's good for my liver. Well, it will help maintain or improve liver health or whatever. We also have statutory regulation. We've got the Fair Trading Act and the Medicines Act and stuff. The difficulty there is there's a whole lot of small stuff and it's really hard to get the regulators to do anything about small stuff. So a lot of the time, it might be breaking the law, but nothing happens. It's, it's tough when we have these great rules, but then if they don't get enforced, what's the point of them? People will feel protected, perhaps, but they aren't necessarily protected. So it sounds like this lack of protection can be problematic. Is it partly this lack of protection that allows things these things to go on and lead to further problems? You're right. Even when using a particular bad diet or um, alternative health product or whatever that doesn't work even if it's direct use isn't going to cause direct harm it doesn't mean that it's harmless you know you could be using it instead of uh, something that will actually help something that needs treatment or you could be using it for something that will just get better on its own but you develop trust in this so you'll later rely on it for something more serious there are a bunch of ways it can cause harm so is there anything people can do to try to find more accurate information or uh, what are the key signs of something being fake? Hmm, where to start with that? This is a lot. <laughs> um, one thing that I would treat as a big red flag is claims along the lines of what we were talking about earlier, supports healthy liver function, that kind of thing. Where it's, the word supports, I think, is a big red flag, especially if it goes on to say supports something you should have already if you're healthy, like support for a healthy heart, that kind of thing. I treat that as a red flag because if, if they could make 
a specific claim because they had evidence backing it, you'd bet they would. And if, if they don't, it's probably because they can't. Always assume that they're putting their best foot forward, and if it's not that impressive or if it's vague, it's probably because they can't back up something stronger. That would be... Um, my advice for that sort of thing, I think. Oh, that's a really good point. Like, I've seen, um, there's a pharmacy near my work, which, it's a pharmacy, but they sell a lot of stuff that doesn't work, and they have a lot of misleading advertising on their website. You know, so sometimes, even if you're going to the right place for advice, it's still not great. So if you're worried this doesn't sound quite right or whatever, look for a second opinion, I guess, or just Google the name of the product and skeptic or criticism or something and see if people are saying it's not backed up by science. Yeah, I suppose I always kind of see it as, you know, if it seems like it's too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if it was some amazing cure for your condition or whatever, your doctor would probably be telling you about it. So what about things like testimonials and adverts? You see them everywhere. Can they be trusted? One of those uh, good rules that's not enforced that I mentioned, we have a law against using health testimonials in medical ads. Do we? We do, but it's not enforced and no one seems to care. I think it's a good rule because health testimonials can be both very convincing and completely misleading. And then there's other stuff like, you know, the, the, the term nutritionist. Anyone can call themselves a nutritionist. There are some societies that you can belong to in New Zealand that sort of are like they rec- have certain requirements before you can join and they're nutritionist groups. But the actual regulated health profession in New Zealand is dietitian. Dietitian is analogous to pharmacist or medical doctor in that if you're not a dietitian and you call yourself a dietitian, you're breaking the law. It's a regulated health profession. You can't call yourself one if you're not. So finally, is, is there a reason you think pseudoscience is so prolific in health? I think it's people who have been scammed in health can't necessarily tell that they've been scammed. If a product you've been sold hasn't worked, you might not know. Biology is complicated. If you have a health problem that lasts a long time and you try 12 different things and eventually it goes away, you just become convinced the 12th thing obviously fixed it. And it's easy to laugh about, but it can be really convincing when that happens to you and you just become convinced this works. I swear by it. And it's really hard to break out of that because, you know, you took this and then things got better. Particularly because the placebo effect comes into all of this. And if you expect it to work, you might actually feel better. People can convince themselves, even when they've been misled or they've been scammed, that no, it worked or it worked for me. And like, maybe it did. And if you feel better, that is great regardless. But if you've been misled, you just, you might not know. That's the thing about health scams in particular, I think, lets them stick around. This is Fake Science with Bronte Wilson. When it comes to science and health, it's a pretty tricky topic to make any conclusive statements about. But if you've learned anything from today, I hope it's that once again, don't take things at face value. If it seems too good to be true, then it probably isn't. There is no wonder pill or tea or shake that will make your body magically clean and healthy but you can focus on getting some variety and trying to balance the good with the bad. Tune in next week as I attempt to tackle the incredibly contentious topic of vaccines. Spoiler alert, they don't cause autism. See you next Wednesday at 3. In breaking news, dietitians have discovered that everything you eat may kill you, so screw your stupid diet.